I'm, I'm going to do some things this morning again in, in, in verse number 12 and 13. And I want to talk to you a little bit about this kind of catch up, some things we did the last couple of weeks. And I, I apologize to you if you're here this morning and you're, this is your first time here or you're not used to being here with us as we're studying uh, in the sense that this is going to be a rather technical kind of study. Uh, this is not going to be, a, I'm not, we're not going to do pop, pop psychology this morning. We're not going to talk about, we're going to talk about some things that are kind of technical things about studying the Bible. And if this is kind of odd to you, just understand there are some things about studying the Bible you need to figure out, okay? Now, those of you that here regularly have been studying with us, you'll, you, you'll understand what we're going to be talking about. But um, verse number 11, 12, and 13 of Ephesians chapter 2 kind of lets you look into the mindset of the Apostle Paul when it comes to his understanding about the dispensational issues about, wor about God's Word. Verse 11, he says, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, but that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you are without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, and having no hope, and without God in the world. Now in time past, God dealt with people on the basis of that distinction between the circumcision and the uncircumcision. And we've studied this in detail. The circumcision, that's, there's a covenant in the Bible called the covenant of circumcision. It's the covenant God made with the nation Israel. And when God made that covenant with the nation Israel, he, he covenanted to do some things through the nation Israel and with the nation Israel, and he made a distinction. And you have the circumcision up here, and underneath them, below them, cut off from them, you have the, the uncircumcision. And if you're up here, the covenants are, are made with you, the promises are made with you, the Word of God's given to you. You have a hope up here, and this is what time past is about. In time past in the Bible, God dealt with people on the basis of that distinction. In the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, when He came, He came, and He came to these people. That's why the verse says in verse 12, the reason Gentiles are cut off back here, they're aliens, because they're, they're aliens and strangers from the covenants of promise, but the issue is in verse 12, you're without Christ. In other words, when the Lord Jesus Christ came, He came as the minister to these people up here. He was their promised Messiah. So when you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you, you see Him dealing with people on, that, on the basis of that distinction between the Jew and the Gentile, the circumcision and the uncircumcision, He would tell His apostles, go not to the way of the Gentiles. Enter into the city of Samaria. Don't go there, but just go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It wasn't because He didn't love the world. It's because God had a covenant with some people to do some things through the nation Israel back here. And that covenant of circumcision given to Abraham set that nation apart from all the nations of the earth. And that's God's chosen nation. Now, with regard to Bible study, time past, I know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in time past because they fit. That's when I see what God's doing there. Jesus Christ dies, is resurrected, he ascends into heaven, the Holy Spirit comes back on the apostles, and you begin in the book of Acts in here, and the book of Acts continues on this program. The Lord Jesus Christ chooses 12 apostles, he trains them for the ministry they're going to carry on over here. And that little flock of believers, fear not little flock, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, the Messiah is going to come back over here one day, and he's going to set up his kingdom over here, and that kingdom is going to be uh, where the Lord Jesus Christ rules and reigns, and then the Word of God is going to go out to the nations through redeemed Israel. So when he says, Fear not, little flock, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, that's a literal, physical, visible, Davidic, earthly kingdom. <laughs> right up the name. It's a real thing. Now when I say that, we call that premillennial Bible study. The premillennial position. Jesus Christ is going to come back before he sets up his kingdom on the earth. That is as much a political statement as it is a doctrinal statement. That's saying that there's not going to be any hope in, the, in any government on this planet until Jesus Christ comes back. Okay? That means there's not going to be any hope in any environmental movement, in any economic movement, in any social movement. You're looking for justice and equality and prosperity. That's when it comes, not till. Now, that doesn't mean you do, don't do the best you can with what you got in the meantime. It just means that you understand that when salvation and real blessing, and by the way, this is the time when the knowledge of God will cover the earth as the water covers the sea. That's the time of worldwide revival, too. That's going to be a wonderful time on the earth <laughs> when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. 
Back here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that was the hope. As the book of Acts begins, that's the hope. Verse 13, he says, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who sometime were far off were made nigh by the blood of Christ. This program back here changed. There came a point when it changed. And the but now, where we are right now, is that that system that was back there, that's going to be brought to fruition over here, isn't what's going on now. God has interrupted that time past program. Now that program in the Bible is called prophecy. Peter talks about it in Acts chapter 3. He says what he's talking about right here is that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. From the time God put the world up into function, put Adam and Eve on the earth, what he'd been talking about, preaching about, prophesying about is that program. The Lord Jesus Christ from heaven reaches down, says a guy named Saul, makes him Paul the Apostle. And in, in here, he gives Paul a system of information that he calls a mystery about the dispensation of the grace of God. Now, a mystery, Romans 16, Paul says, the mystery is a secret. It's that which the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. Now, a six-year-old kid that flunked kindergarten can get that. If you've got a preacher that can't, that's his problem. You get people tell you you, got, you can't understand the Bible unless you, got, you, know, you know Greek or you know Hebrew or you've got a college education or you've got a seminary trained preacher. Listen, all you need to do is be able to read sixth grade English and you can get that. Something that was kept secret since the world began is different from something that was made known since the world began. I've told you for years, I... On the radio, on the television, I quote those verses all the time, Acts 3.21, Romans 16.25. And I've had people call me and, and, and say, Brother Rick, don't you know any other verses? <laughs> I say, yeah, I do. Get those straight and we'll get the rest of them. But you've got to get this straight to start with. There is an interruption in that prophetic program where we are right now. Okay? Now, the trickiest part in the Bible for you to study is going to be this period of the book of Acts right here. Because that's where the transition between time past and but now takes place. So come with me to Romans chapter 11. We've been looking at this passage. Romans chapter 11. Verse number 11. They don't expect me to make any mistakes. I don't have an eraser. Is that without? I thought that was a cell phone. <laughs> Don't that look like a cell phone? Yeah. Does to me. I, I want to enlarge this right in here a little bit while we talk, so I'm going to erase some of that. That's not much of an eraser, though, is it? Okay, good. They did know I was going to make, make mistakes, okay? Romans chapter 11, verse 11. Now, this is all review, okay? Those of you that have been here, you know that. Romans 11, 11, I say then have they, and that's talking about the nation Israel, stumbled that they should fall. There came a point when the nation Israel stumbled at that stumbling stone which was laid in Zion. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. They stumble, but they don't fall. Okay? But rather, through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, wait a minute. They stumble, but they don't fall. But then they do fall. Now, before you run to the woodshed and say, whoo, 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 I've got to get something easier to read. I don't understand that. That's simple. You stumble, you don't fall. Then you go along and you stumble and you do fall. You've done that. I did that right out in the parking lot about, about four weeks ago. By the way, weren't you, this past week, weren't you expecting the trees to come out? I was. Such a beautiful, warm weather we were having this week, and the, the lilies were popping up out of the ground. We were at the McDonald's in the kitchen. Look, look Grandpa, something coming out of the ground. And, the fly, and I'm looking at the crabapple tree outside my front door, and it's not, not doing a thing. And I'm thinking, I bet it knows something I don't know. <laughs> then I heard the, the news, the weather last night. And we're going to get snow again tomorrow. And I'm thinking, that tree, he's brilliant. So that's my new weatherman, is the crabapple tree. 
I hate crab apple trees except when they're blue, blooming in the spring. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to be nice to this crab apple tree because he's right. But okay, so maybe tomorrow you can do it in the parking lot. But you walk across the ice, you stumble a little bit, you catch yourself, and I walked another three or four feet, and bang. You know that sensation when you look out and you see your feet about chin high? And you just have that sensation, this is not going to end good. Well, I had that right out there by the, <laughs> by the pond. And that's what that verse is talking about. Now, when they stumbled, the last verse in chapter 9 tells you that he laid in Zion a stumbling stone. That's the Messiah. That's this ministry back here. They stumble at the Lord Jesus Christ. They crucify him. They miss him. And they don't fall. The fall of Israel does not take place at the cross. But rather through their fall. Then they do fall. Subsequent to the cross, over here in the book of Acts, they fall. The first seven chapters of the book of Acts is a renewed opportunity given to Israel to repent. He said, you speak a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven you. You speak a word against the Holy Ghost, it won't be forgiven you. They, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what to do. They don't fall at the cross. Hebrews chapter 2 says, that we, how should we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Hebrews 2 verse 3 and 4 tell you that the, the early Acts period, the Pentecostal era, is not something new. It's the continuation of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's why on the television and the radio, I'll often say, we represent one of the only non-Pentecostal ministries in this area. And we do. And most people think Pentecostal, they think of the Pentecostal denomination. If you start the church at Acts 2, you're Pentecostal, because that's a Pentecostal church back there. Now, there comes a time when there is a fall of Israel. That takes place with Stephen. When Stephen is, is stoned here, before he's stoned, he looks at Israel and he, he pronounces on them, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers do, so do you. He says, you have become spiritually just like this crowd down here. And at that point, the rest of that verse takes place. Through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now come down to verse number 30. I want you to notice how thoroughly they have fallen. Verse number 28. As concerning the gospel, they, Israel, are what? Enemies for your sakes. You ever heard anybody say they're, they're a spiritual Jew? People like to go around. We, the, the, whole, the whole theology that, 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 that rejects dispensational Bible study says that the church, the believers today, are really spiritual Israel. You're the continuation of Israel. If you are, what does that verse say you are? You're an enemy. As touching the fathers, their, as the election, their blood for the fathers. So God has interrupted their program and is doing something different today, but he's going to finish it. If God gave Abraham his word and covenanted and swore by himself, he'll do what he said. But he's just interrupted it today. Now verse 30. For as ye, you Gentiles, in time past, have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy. So back there, in time past, the Gentiles didn't believe God. But now, they have obtained mercy. Now, back here, the Gentiles walked in their own way. God gave them up. We studied that. And he let them walk in their own ignorance while he dealt with the nation Israel. Now, with the fall of Israel, he says... Even as you, in time past, have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through what? Their unbelief. They fell because of their unbelief. They've been set aside. What's the condition of Israel now? In unbelief. Who was already in unbelief? See that? Israel has now been placed in the same spiritual status as the Gentiles. So now, instead of the Gentiles going up and becoming like Israel, Israel has become like the Gentiles. You follow that? That's what it means, the fall of Israel. Verse 31, Even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy, for God that concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. So when he set Israel aside because of their unbelief, and through the fall of Israel, put them down here. He did it so that he could have mercy on everybody on an equal basis. 
Okay? So go back to verse 11. Through the fall of Israel, salvation has come to the Gentiles to do what? To provoke Israel to jealousy. There comes a, there's, a time, there's a time period in here, verse number 13, he talks about the diminishing of them. There's a time period in here when he, when the nation Israel becomes less and less an issue. They fall. Now when they fell, they fell into unbelief. That's where they fell. They are not falling. They have fallen. But then they are diminishing. They lost the opportunity to be that channel of blessing through whom God would work. The opportunity for the nation to be redeemed into her kingdom, they lost it. Okay? That's what the fall of Israel has to do with. They did that, and when they did it, salvation now goes to everybody down here that's in unbelief. Then prophecy, they got their salvation through the rise of Israel. Gentiles got saved through the rise of Israel, okay? Oh, and here we're getting saved through the fall of Israel. Now, verse number 13, Paul says, For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. So if I wanted to go in the Bible and look for my information, talking to me as a Gentile, I'd go to the books of Romans to Philemon and say, There's my message, because there's my apostle. Okay? Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul is given the, God, the dispensation of the grace of God for the Gentiles, Ephesians 3 says. Paul is the one who is our apostle, and he's the one that gives us the ministry that God has for us today. That's not hard to get in the Scripture. Verse number 13, I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I'm the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. There is a period of time here where Paul is carrying on his Gentile apostleship in a way as so as to provoke them which are my flesh and might save some. Now we've talked about that. Paul does some things during his, his, this, the, the Acts, his, his Acts ministry. People talk about Paul doing things in his early Acts ministry. Listen, most of his ministry is in the book of Acts. Okay, you get over to Acts 28, and he's two years in a in, in a hired house, and then he then he's got a little bit more ministry after that. But most of his ministry is in the book of Acts. Most of his earthly ministry was in Christ Paul's ministry was in that provoking period. Now he conducted his Gentile ministry in such a way to make those lost Jews out there be jealous, to try to get some of them saved. What did he do? He took things, that's why you see Paul and his ministry during the book of Acts doing things that belong to Israel. And we looked at those things the last two weeks. Sometimes people wonder why was Paul doing these things that pertain to Israel's kingdom program. For example, in Acts 13, he says it's necessary that, I, that, the, that the word be first be preached to you, Israel. Why would Paul say he needed to go first to Israel? Well, that was, that was the commission in Matthew, Luke 24. That was the order in Acts 1. Why would Paul take that? Why would Paul then, in, in, in uh, Acts 16, when the Philippian jailer gets saved, go and water baptize him? You know? Why would he then see visions? Why would he talk in tongues? Why would he circumcise Timothy? Why would he go out and shave his head and take a vow and pay for some sacrifices, animal sacrifices made in the temple. Say, so what is he doing? So you see that in the book of Acts. You see he's doing these weird things. They all have to do with Israel, but why is Paul doing it? If, it, if, if that's this program over here, why is he doing it over here in this program? In order to explain that, you know, why, the explanation for that is that provoking, Paul did... He never taught any of the body of Christ to be circumcised. In fact, he took Titus with him in Galatians chapter 2 and dared the, 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 the Pentecostal church to try to circumcise him. And they didn't. Why? They saw it wasn't for him. He says in Galatians, if you're, try if you're going to be circumcised, Christ profits you nothing. 
circumcision availeth nothing, uncircumcision availeth nothing, but love, the faith that works by love, Galatians 5, 6. When Paul taught the body of Christ about circumcision, he says it's of no value. Then why is he doing it? He did some things in order to be a testimony to the nation Israel that their things now are gone to the Gentiles. Okay? He never taught them as doctrine for the body of Christ. He water baptized some people. In fact, he says in 1 Corinthians 1, I baptized Crispus and Gaius and maybe a few other people, I don't remember. Obviously it wasn't important to him. But then he says, for Christ sent me not to baptize. The only statement Paul made about water baptism was I didn't do much of it, and the reason is Christ didn't send me to do it. Well, then why did he do it? Well, water baptism was a part of Israel's program. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, we've been through all this. I can move on. So he's expl the explanation for those things is that Paul is trying to demonstrate both to Israel and to the Gentiles Romans 15, that God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the pro, he's gone out among the... He's not doing it to try to edify the body of Christ. He's doing it as a testimony that through the fall of Israel, salvation has gone to the Gentiles. You with me? Now, because of those, those odd things that he does, there are people who say, well, you've got to ask, when did the body of Christ begin? We know it wasn't Pentecost. I'm telling you, it began here with the salvation and commissioning of the Apostle Paul because that's when, some, that's when your apostle and your dispensation shows up. But then there are people that say, but wait a minute, because he did these strange things and they, they don't believe the body of Christ began until Acts chapter 28. And that's the, that's the other extreme. If you come over with me to Acts chapter 28, and here, here's... And this is an issue that you need to understand a little bit about because it's very easy to get pushed into some of this thinking if you don't understand why Paul did those things that were in the program before him. There were things that he did that pertained to, to Israel's program, Israel's kingdom program. He doesn't teach the body of Christ his doctrine, but he did it. And people, if you focus on what he did instead of what he wrote and taught, you understand, that's where that's a problem. And in Acts 28, verse number 25, Paul is at the end of the book of Acts. He's at Rome. He gathers together some of the Jewish uh, teachers there. Uh, verse 17, It came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, and he begins to talk to them. Verse 25, And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Well, the spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet, saying unto the fathers, uh, 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 the, unto the fathers, saying, "Go unto thy people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand; seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and the ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart." and should be converted, and I should heal them. What's he doing? He's saying, you, God has concluded you in unbelief. Now, 28. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said this, when he had, uh, uh, when he had said these words, the Jews departed. Verse 28 the Acts 28 view is that that's the point. Okay, you've turned your back on it. You're in unbelief. Now the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, and they now will hear. And the idea, the people that teach that say there's a dispensational boundary draw, drawn right there. If you've heard of the names of uh, Charles Welch, E.W. Bullinger, those kind of people, that's where, this, that, that's where it originally originated with Charles Welch. And he, he uh, was a young man, Bullinger was an old man, and... Bullinger's name got attached to it because he had a bigger audience and so forth. But they, they say, well, we draw a line right there. And something new then begins. Now, the, the question then is, and, and by the way, Romans 11, 11 helps you with this because Romans is written in Acts 20. 
Is Acts 20 before Acts 28? This is deep Bible study here. <laughs> sure it is. Okay. So prior to Acts, Acts 20, it was true that through the fall of Israel, salvation went to the Gentiles. So Israel's fall had taken place prior to Acts 20, and salvation had gone to the Gentiles prior to Acts 20. That's before Acts 28. So Acts 28 is too late. Nothing begins in Acts 28. Something ended in Acts 28. And what ended is that provoking ministry. Okay? Now that's what ended. And that's what, what the issue is. Now when he says the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, he doesn't say shall be. It is. It has been going and it is now going to the Gentiles. Paul's in jail. You see verse 32, 30, uh, 30, 30. Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came to him. Paul's on, he, he's in bonds. He's in chains. He's in bondage. He writes in Ephesians about his bonds. He writes in Philippians about his bonds. He writes in Colossians about his bonds. He writes in Philemon about his bonds. Those are the books that he wrote in that, in that two-year period of time right there. He's in bondage. He's not out preaching. If, it, if you're waiting for Paul to get out and preach it to the Gentiles, it's too late. He's saying, it is. It's there, guys. Why? Because the fall of Israel took place right there, and salvation went to the Gentiles through Paul's ministry to provoke his lost Israel to get saved. And when he got over as far out as Rome, he tells them, hey guys, it's, it's a done deal. Okay? Now, again, the reason that people have a problem is to say, okay, but what about? I mean, you go back up in, in chapter 28, and you look at verse number... 4, verse 3, when Paul had gathered a, a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, then came a viper out of the fire and fastened on him. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt, and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked on, on him, or they looked when he should have swa uh, swollen and fallen down, uh, fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds. They repented <laughs> and said that he was a god. Now there's Paul working a miracle. That's Acts 28, the miracle of healing, takes up serpents. and You say, well, I thought that's what Israel's program was. This laid out, he's still doing that stuff. And so people say, well, okay, well, then that hadn't ended yet, so it must not end until after Acts 28. Now, when you do that, the difficulty with it is that you've ignored the fact that the fall of Israel has already taken place. So now you've got to make that something else. Then you have to have an explanation for what Paul's doing for that 30 years in there. Okay? So, go back to verse number 30. After he's made this pronouncement, notice verse 30. Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came unto him, preaching, what? The kingdom of God and teaching those things con concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. What was Paul preaching for that two years after Acts 28? He's preaching the kingdom of God. What did the book of Acts begin preaching? Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom? It starts out preaching the kingdom. It ends Paul preaching the kingdom. And he's preaching the kingdom two years after Acts 28, 28. You see, when you get that kind of thinking, it, 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 it winds up proving too much. <laughs> now, just so you understand. And by the way, that's the period, that two-year period that he wrote. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. We call them the prison epistles. Come back with me to Acts 20. It shouldn't surprise you that he's preaching the kingdom of God. If you go back to Acts 20, verse number 22, he tells the Ephesian elders, Now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, 
to, to uh, not knowing the things which shall befall me there. He winds up, goes to Jerusalem, winds up getting taken in custody and, and sent to Rome. Say that the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying, Bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy the ministry, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. To do what? Testify the gospel of the grace of God. What's the ministry he received of the Lord Jesus? To, to, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He says in Ephesians 2, how that by revelation, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God that's given to me to you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. To do what? To give it to you Gentiles. Now, verse 25. And now, behold, I know, I, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone testifying the gospel of the grace of God. But what did it say? Preaching the kingdom of God. You shall see my face no longer. Now, people say, well, wait a minute. I, is he preaching the kingdom message or is he not? Well, yes and yes and, yes and no. <laughs> Depends on what you mean by the kingdom of God. Come with me to Romans chapter 7, Romans 14. Get Romans 14 in one hand and Luke chapter 14. Romans 14 and Luke 14. Romans chapter 14, verse number 17. And Luke chapter 14, verse number 15. Luke chapter 14, verse 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that eateth bread in the kingdom of God. Blessed is the guy that will sit in, the, in that literal, physical, visible, earthly, Davidic kingdom and eat with you. See that? They're going to eat bread in the kingdom of God. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, wait a minute. Which is it? It's both. The kingdom of God, the rule, what God is doing today is not meat and drink, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. What he's going to do over here with Israel is meat and drink. So when Paul preached the kingdom of God, he preached something different than what Peter preached when he preached the kingdom of God. You follow that? Crank your mind up and go, think about it. Okay, the message, his view, now what would Paul have said about what Peter said? He would have said that through the fall of Israel, that program's been interrupted and set aside, and through the fall of Israel, a new program has gone out here. But you know what this is? This is still God's program. Okay, Colossians chapter 1, verse number 13, 12. Colossians 1, 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us in the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. He's taken you out from under the authority of the adversary, Satan, and his, the kingdom of darkness, and put you into the rulership and the reign of King Jesus. You say, well, I didn't think he was a king. Well, then you need to go back over and read 1 Timothy chapter 1, where he's called the, Paul calls him the king immortal. If you're an ambassador for Christ, you need to have a governmental head to represent. Okay? He's the rightful king of the universe. What the body of Christ is going to do is exercise the headship of the king in the heavenly places, in his heavenly branch of the kingdom. So don't, get, don't, don't let this stuff, don't let shallow thinking about these things stop you from grabbing and understanding what's going on. When Paul preached, go back to Acts 28, when he did that for two years, he was not preaching Israel's program. Paul never preached Israel's program. Why? Because Israel's program was interrupted right back here. There weren't any Israel's program for Paul to preach. And when the Acts 28ers tell you that what happened between uh, Paul, uh, Stephen and Acts 28 is that the dispensation of the promise, the covenants of promise were still going on, you look at them and say, no, those fell. The covenants of promise 
stopped right there. Why? Because the verse says through the fall of Israel. Well, what in Israel fell? Her program. You with me? I just, just, you have to believe it. Just follow what I'm saying. You got, you got Acts 28. Hold your hand. Come back to Romans chapter 11. Just, I'll make that point just one, one more way. Romans 11, verse number 7. What then? Israel hath not attained that which he seeketh for. The nation hasn't attained it. But the election hath obtained it. And the rest were blinded. So the little flocks got the promise, but the rest, all the rest of Israel, all the rest of the nation, all of the rest of them are unbelievers. They're blinded. When did that take place? That's what went on in Acts with the fall of Israel. That's what he's going to tell you in verse 11. According as it is written, God hath given to them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear unto this day. Now watch. And David said, Let their table be made a snare and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense. Let their eyes be darkened, lest they should, uh, that, that they should not see, and bow down their back all the way. I say then, based on what God's done, their tables become a snare. They're blinded. Have they stumbled that they should fall? Did they stumble and fall over there? No. But then they did fall over here. They fell from their table of blessing. You remember that Gentile woman in Matthew 15? She said, yes, Lord, but the, the Gentiles, the, the, the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Where was she? She's down here. Where is Israel fallen? They're no longer able to sit at the table. After Acts 7, those lost Israelis couldn't sit down at the table and say, we're God's people, feed us, Lord. Why? Because they've fallen down there on the ground with the Gentiles. Okay? Now come back to Acts 28. Here's, here's one of the verses in Acts 28 that per, encourages people to think Acts 28 is the end of Paul's Acts ministry, is, 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 is the end of a ministry in here that Paul had carrying on Israel's program. Acts 28, verse number 17. We read verse 17, how he's gone to Jerusalem, gathered them together. Verse 18, well, gathered the Jews together. Verse 18, who when they had examined me uh, would have let me go, talking about the Romans, because there was no cause of death in me. Uh, well, I, go back to verse 17, just read that all together. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, men and, bre men and brethren, though... I have committed nothing against the people or the customs of our fathers. Yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. You see how he says that? He, he, that he's, he went into the synagogue, into the temple, and so forth, and took, did the things that were the customs of Israel. He did that so he could say that right there. He said, I'm not against you guys. I'm not trying to destroy you guys. I just got something else to tell you who when they had examined him, me would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I come a call for you to see you and to speak unto you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. In Acts 28, person says, see, Paul says in Acts 28, he's bound for the hope of Israel. Now, what does it mean to be bound with this chain for the hope of Israel? What is the hope of Israel? Well, come back with me to chapter 23, because he's been fighting with the Jews about this issue ever since the Jews were the one who provoked the Romans to take him into custody. You come back to chapter 23. Paul, earnestly beholding the council, talking about the Sanhedrin of Israel. Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Verse 6. And when he perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part and the other Pharisees, he cried out into the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee 
a son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, am I called into question? What was the hope that he's called into question for? The resurrection. Come over with me to chapter 24. They didn't like that, by the way, and they provoked the Romans to take him. Chapter 24, verse number 14. But this I confess unto thee, and he's, he's in front of Felix now, and this I confess unto thee, that after the, the way which they call heresy, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things that are written in the law and the prophets, and having hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there should be a resurrection of the dead, both just and unjust. What's the hope that they all allow? The resurrection. Come with me to chapter 24. That was 24. Okay, 25. What's next? <laughs> chapter 25. Verse 14. And when they had, they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause. Now, we're, now we're in front of, uh, we're with the Romans again. Still, still you're with Agrippa and, and so forth here. Uh, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, There's a certain man left in bonds by Felix. So now here's Paul. He's in bonds. Still, the Romans have him. Come down to verse number, just for time's sake, verse number 17. Therefore, when they were come thither, hither, without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat, and, and this is Felix talking, and commanded the man to be brought forth, against whom, when the accusers stood up, they brought none accusation of such things as I supposed, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition, of one Jesus, which, Paul, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Now, what's the questions? <laughs> it's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the problem. Now, come over to chapter 26. And this is one you, gotta, you want to be careful to notice. Chapter 26. If you just read down through the first five verses, he, Paul's in front of Agrippa here. In verse number 6, verse 5, he, uh, let's start in verse 4. My manner of life from my youth, which was first which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. Paul was a well-known Jewish rabbi. He was a rabbinical scholar of great note. They all knew him. This is 25 years later. They still, his reputation is still widely known among the Jews. Okay, My, uh, Verse 5, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most strict sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Now that thing back over there in chapter 23 told you that the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, Sadducees didn't. He said, I'm a right-wing fundamental Bible thumper. Okay. And now, verse 6, I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made unto God, made of God unto my fathers. Now, the hope of the promise made unto our fathers. Notice that. The promise is the kingdom. That's what God promised Abraham. That's what that Abrahamic covenant promises them, is a kingdom. A land, a nation, and salvation. You remember we studied that. The hope of receiving that promise is the resurrection. Okay? So when he says, I am bound for the hope of Israel, he's saying, I'm in chains for the hope that Israel has of receiving anything from God. And what's the hope? The resurrection. So when he says, I'm bound for the hope of Israel, he's, t he's talking about, I'm bound for the issue of the resurrection. And whose resurrection really is it? It's Christ, because it's Christ's resurrection that confirms the promises made to the Father. Okay? Now come back with me, if you will, to Ephesians. Get Acts 28, and look at Ephesians chapter number 6. When Paul explains to the Jews 
in Acts 20, to the lost Israelis in Acts 28 at Rome, who he is seeking to win and not offend, he says, I'm in chains, and I'm bound in these chains for the hope of Israel, for the, resur the issue of the, what is Israel's hope? The resurrection. God told Abraham, I'm going to give you this land and your seed for this land. I'm going to give it to you forever. And by the way, Abe, you're going to die. Not only you, but your, your kids are going to die. 400 years are going to a strange land. Now, if I'm going to give you, a, give you a land and you're going to die before you get it, what does that mean? Abraham understood, and he said, you're going to get that land forever, everlasting possession. Abraham understood that he was going to get everlasting life, because that's what kind of life you have to have if you're going to live in the land forever. And he also knew he had to be resurrected, because he said he's going to die before he got it. You understand why resurrection is so important to them? I got a promise, and the hope of that promise is the resurrection. Now Paul says, I'm in chains for, for that issue. But look at Ephesians chapter 3. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 6. Now here's an interesting... Ephesians 6 verse 19. And he's talking about, Pray for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may speak, open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now did Abraham know what the mystery of the gospel was? That's the stuff... I want to be able to preach this stuff right here, this special message been given to me. Four, verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in bonds. Now when Paul explained that, come on to Colossians 4, when Paul tells you in his epistles why he's in chains, why he's in bondage, why does he say he's in bondage? For the mystery of the gospel. You, you following that? Now that's different. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 3. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving with all praying also for us that God would open to us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Now in Acts 28, why was, in, why was he in chains? He was in chains because the Jews didn't like what he was preaching about the resurrection and they, they incited Rome to put him in jail. See that? And he says, I'm in, I'm in chains for the, the hope of Israel. But when he writes Ephesians and, Philippians and, and Colossians, and he tells them why he's in chains, he says, I'm in chains, I'm in bonds for the, for the mystery of Christ, for the mystery of the gospel. He doesn't say he's in chains for Israel's program. He says, I'm in chains for the new program. Now tell me something. At that time right there, where did any Israeli have any hope? Did they have any hope back here in Israel's program? Why? That program had fallen. That lost Jew in, Paul, under Paul, in, in Paul's ministry there, that lost Jew had hope in only one place. And that was in the message Paul's preaching. And when Paul says, for the hope of Israel, I'm bound to this chain, he's not saying, I'm bound for Israel's kingdom program. He's saying, I'm bound with a chain because the message that I'm preaching is the only place you lost Jews have any hope. Come with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. There's no hope. Listen. After, when, the, when the fall of Israel took place in Acts 7, there was no hope in the Abrahamic covenant. There was no hope in Israel's program for anyone during Paul's ministry. Paul's ministry is predicated on the fall of Israel and salvation going to the Gentiles. His ministry is predicated on the middle wall of perdition being taken down, the distinction between circumcision and uncircumcision being done away with. His whole ministry is predicated on there being one group of people all concluded in unbelief. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 9. And they themselves show unto us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from what? The people at Thessalonica that he's writing to previously were a bunch of idol worshipers. 
Now somebody says, well, but he went to the synagogue and preached to some people in the synagogue. Yeah, he did. And if that's who he's talking about, then they were idol worshipers. We've been studying the book of Hosea on Wednesday night. And you know what happens to idol worshiping uh, Israelis? God had put them under his wrath. If you're a bunch of idol worshiping Israelis, you're not any different from a bunch of idol worshiping Gentiles. You're a bunch of idol worshipers. And an idol worshiping Israeli didn't have any hope in the, in, the, in the covenant of Abraham. That's why, listen, if you were an idol worshiping Israeli, you know what you were? You were in unbelief. And he had concluded you in unbelief. And so to go look at those acts, the, the, the synagogues that Paul is preaching in, and say, well, those are some people that still had a program, Israel's program going on, is to ignore Romans 11, verse 11. That's why I told you that verse is going to be powerful to understand what's going on in the book of Acts. Come over to chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God which are in Judea, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both kill the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and persecuted us. So what, Israel, what unbelieving Israel has done is they kill the Lord Jesus, they, they kill their prophets, and now they're persecuting Paul. They don't want God's word from, no matter where it comes from. And are contrary to all men. They're, they oppose everything God's doing. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, watch, to fill up their sins always for the wrath of What's that next word? Doesn't say shall. Doesn't say might. It says, is come upon them to the uttermost. That's the first epistle Paul wrote. Acts 18. Now, somebody want to argue Galatians was sooner. Okay. But you're right at the beginning of Paul's writing ministry. And he says, the wrath of God is come upon those people to the uttermost. And they're so blind, they're out trying to stop my ministry. And my ministry is the only thing that keeps the wrath of God from falling on them. Because the next thing in the program is God's wrath. And the only reason that wrath didn't, didn't fall back here is because God interrupted the program. And they're so blind that the very thing is keeping God's wrath all, uh, off of them. The only place giving them any hope is in Paul's ministry. And they want to stop that. Shows you how blind they are. The clock says I've got to stop. This is all introduction <laughs> to the four points I wanted to give you about why it's not cool to be Acts 28, why, why being Acts 28 is not great. <laughs> but I want you to see what it is that they're teaching and why it doesn't work and why Romans 11, 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 help you understand. If you can get something like that to be the paradigm, what Paul teaches, and then take the other stuff and put it on that, instead of taking his epistles and try to put it on the other. The great, the great, the great damage done by the Acts 28 doctrine. When you say the body of Christ did not begin until Acts 28, or that Paul had some kind of different ministry prior to Acts 28, is that you destroy the integrity of his epistles. No longer do you have Romans to Philemon as your doctrine. Because now Romans and Corinthians and Galatians and Thessalonians, written during the Acts period, were written to people that are not part of the body of Christ. And Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, and Philemon, and 2 Timothy are all you got. Now, you understand the problem with that? That's where you get in trouble. That's why it means something. It's far better for you to not understand and not have a, a cogent answer even for why Paul did some of these programs back here than to lose those epistles from your life. There's corrective doctrine in those epistles that correct some of this stuff that goes on back here, by the way. It's good to have that. It's good to understand why it's there. But it's important for you to understand that your doctrine today. Now when I say that, somebody says, well, Brother Rick, you, you, you think that
that you can only get Paul, you can only read Paul's epistles, you know better than that. First thing in Paul's you read is Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, separated of the gospel of God, called to be an apostle, separated of the gospel of God. If you didn't know more than the book of Romans, you wouldn't know who Jesus Christ was. You wouldn't know who God that separated him was. Okay? Paul expects you to study all the Bible. He expects you to know all the Bible, but he expects you to understand when you're reading this back here where it fits and where your mail is, we're talking about what God's doing today is right here. This didn't just pop out of nowhere. God planned it before the foundation of the world. And all that we'll see next time when we look at this, all this stuff back here he was doing, knowing this was coming, and he arranged things back there so that when this showed up, you knew he had this on his mind all along. That's what all fits together. That's why the edification design is my, my, my gospel, the mystery program, and the scriptures of the prophets. Because once you understand our program, you get, found, you get grounded and oriented to God's grace in my gospel, Book of Romans. Then you get advanced, uh, oriented to the advanced information about what he's going to do with the body of Christ in the heavenly places in the ages to come. <clears throat> then you see how it all fits with all the rest of the scripture. And then you'd be able to stand on your own two feet and not have somebody toss you to and fro by taking verses out of back there and sticking them on here or taking some verse in here and sticking it over here. Okay? Well, clearly revealed. Start, the, 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 the fall takes place here. But that period of time right there, and I've got to tell you, the book of Acts, because of that changing is a dangerous place for you to be if you don't have a place to fix your understanding. And I recommend Romans 11 to you for that purpose. Because, well, let me say, you, you, you might not ever figure every, well, I shouldn't say that, you'll never figure everything out. That's what makes it secure, that's what keeps your curiosity going. <laughs> keeps your interest going. But if you get that kind of foundation, you can say those verses are clear. And you always go by the clear, not by the unclear. Okay? Now, I close my Bible because if I don't, I'll keep talking. I appreciate the fact that, I, that you uh, are able to let me teach like that and it not be over about probably 80% of your head and uh, that you can appreciate it. And for the rest of you, you, know, you, get, you get it at the level you can get it. But just understand, don't let somebody come along and try to, try to divide up Paul's ministry for you. The things that he did in the book of Acts that pertain to Israel's program, he did as a part of a ministry to provoke lost Jews to see that God had gone to the Gentiles through his ministry and for them to get saved. He did it to demonstrate to you the issue of progressive revelation. He didn't get all the information at one whack. And the reason he did that is so that you can see the issue of edification. The edification pattern, the growing, maturing pattern for you is to go from being a babe and a child to an adult. And if you've ever noticed when you get to be an adult, you just keep being a, growing still. You get old like me, you know, older like me. <laughs> and you look back and you say, you know, when I was 30, I thought I had things together, and now I realize I was a pretty dumb cluck. But for 30, I wouldn't do it too bad. I was reading a thing just recently. They said that most business people, educators, leaders in science and industry and politics and economics, most people that make great strides, do, do so between their 50th and 80th year. You know why that is? You get a little experience in life. You've been around the block a couple of times. You've learned some things that allow you to look at things with a little more maturity, a little more stability, a little more insight. Now, you love to have the younger people around because they've got some energy. When you get old, you don't have the energy. <laughs> So it doesn't mean when you're young you don't do something. It means that you just realize, hey, I'm, work, I'm going now, and there's more. That's progressive revelation. And that's, it's designed to teach you that. That the whole maturing process never comes to a conclusion for you until you get the glory.
And then it's the exceeding greatness of his riches then. Okay? All right. Let me just take a minute and say to you that if you did come in here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, this would have had to have been just, huh? We're not an entertainment organization. We're a Bible study church. You're sitting in a group of people that want to study and understand God's Word for themselves. My purpose, Brother Alex's purpose, is to teach you the Scripture so you don't really need us. You can do it yourself. You grow up into that. But first you need Christ. You need to trust Him. You need to believe in Him. One of the very few times Paul ever says, uses the name Jesus by itself, is in Romans 3.26 when he says, believe, he's just and justify them that believe in Jesus. Jesus is his name that was given because he'll be a savior from your sins. That's where it starts. You have to be saved because you're lost. God's fi fixed it so that you can be. He offers it to you as a gift, and you receive it by faith. And when you receive that gift by faith, what you receive is the gift of eternal life. And it begins that moment. And then you can start getting in His Word and let His Word become the wisdom and life that it's designed to be. But it all begins by trusting Him. And for those of you who've trusted Him as you've received Him, so walk ye in Him. All the things you face in life, the key is in that book. But it's of no value to it. You don't just pick up and say, there's the key, hey, hey. You know, watching a hockey game, guy gets the puck, he's, I got the puck, look at him. It's not what you do. What do you do with the puck? You put it in the goal. Like you don't pick it up at all. You just shoot the thing. Pass the thing. We do that. We say, I got the key, look at here. And we wonder, what do you do with the key? You believe it. And it's that obedience of faith that gives it life in you. Father, we thank you today for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the riches of your grace, the clarity of your word. In our Savior's name, amen.